And then you should be able to see Olivia, Kristen, and Blair uh, as pinned panelists here in our in our meeting. Um, and I will now give them a chance to introduce themselves. Um, we'd love to hear who you are, what you're currently doing, and just some general background information. But uh, Olivia, if you don't mind going first, uh, we'll kick it over to you. Sure, not at all. Uh, can you hear me okay, first of all? Check, great. Okay, always the first thing to double check. So yes, hi, I'm Olivia Ambrogio. I go by she, her, um, and I am the assistant director of the Sharing Science Program at AGU, the American Geophysical Union currently, and I'll come back to what that is in a minute. Um, just some background. I'm a biologist by training. I got my PhD studying the sex lives of marine snails, which are a lot of fun, in case anyone wants to talk about it later, happy to. Um, and then as I was moving through my PhD, the kind of disconnect in the understanding of what science is and how it's done by those within science and those outside of it, that gap was really bugging me. And because I also have a background in English and writing and communication, I thought, well, maybe this is a niche for me, somewhere between the science and the communication sphere. Um, I had a very circuitous route that I liken to the Odyssey that I would not recommend to others to get into uh, the profession and ended up eventually at AGU helping them develop their sharing science program. So AGU, for those who aren't familiar, it's an earth and space science society uh, with members who are actually worldwide rather than just within the US. And so members involve people doing all kinds of different stuff from atmosphere to climate, to uh, planets, to oceans, to natural hazards, all kinds of things. Um, and what Sharing Science does, its mission is to help scientists in particular, though some others as well, communicate effectively with others. And whether that's other scientists and other disciplines, whether that's people down the street, whether that's tribal communities, whether that's other kinds of policy and decision makers, journalists, you know, through different media and social media and multimedia and so on and so forth, whatever venue, how can you build dialogue? How can you build trust? How can you um, create memorable and relevant messages to talk with other audiences? So that's really um, what the program is about. And so what a lot of what I do is webinars, workshops, developing resources and toolkits and providing one-on-one -on -one support for a smaller group that we work with every year to really facilitate that kind of communication. Excellent. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks so much for being here. Um, Kristen, we'll kick it over to you for an introduction. Okay, sounds good. And I'm just going to do a little sound check as well as I'm working off my phone right now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my name is Kristen Steele, and I graduated very recently, just this past May, from Tulane University with my PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, so um, my route to the point where I started my PhD um, kind of took me meandering through different environmental policy and field ecology position. So I did kind of a little bit of each before I landed back in school pursuing graduate education. Um, and then now that I've graduated, um, I've kind of circled my way back towards a more ecology policy focused career path, whereas my PhD was very field ecology based. Um, so currently, I am a fellow with the Gulf Research Science Policy Fellowship Program, um, and the program, the GRP as it's called for short, is a division of the National Academies of Science, which is based in Washington, D.C., and the GRP really focuses on bringing science and engineering knowledge to the Gulf and enhancing the local communities here. So as part of the fellowship, um, current or recent graduates, um, so you can still be in school as part of the fellowship or have recently graduated. Um, you're matched with a host organization along the Gulf Coast. Um, and these can be a variety of state or federal or nonprofit um, agencies that are all working in the science policy arena in some capacity. Um, and I was matched with the Restore Council, which is a federal agency, the smallest federal agency, um, which was established by the Restore Act specifically to distribute funds from the BP Horizon oil spill to agencies that are working along the Gulf, um, restoring, conserving, and enhancing the Gulf of Mexico's ecosystems. Um, so as a fellow, my overall goals um, with the Restore Council are really, of course, to 
provide help to the agency in any way I can using the skills I've gained throughout my academic career and my um, working career as well. Um, and to really just kind of learn how the best available science is being taken and applied to these issues that are facing the Gulf through the work the Restore Council is doing. Um, so that's in short uh, where I'm at right now and based here in New Orleans as well. So, yeah. Great, thanks so much, Kristen. All right, Blair, over to you. Mm -hmm. Hey y'all, um, can y'all hear me? Awesome, cool. Hi, um, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, similar to Kristen, I'm also a science policy fellow with um, the National Academy of Sciences Gulf Research Program, but I am uh, based out of Tallahassee in Florida, and my host office is the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, it has been such a cool experience to plug into really, you know, a state that has so much agriculture. And most of my work has been with the Division of Aquaculture here. Um, and so a lot of the policy work that I've been involved with is based around this idea of nutrient credit trading with aquaculture as a way to mitigate nutrient pollution in coastal waters throughout the state of Florida. So there's been a lot of you know, scientific research synthesis involved with that and also a lot of policy framework building. Um, and as a pet project for my fellowship, I also, um, along with a lot of our other fantastic coworkers and um, you know, partners throughout the state, we were able to put together a conference for women and gender minorities in aquaculture. Um, which was super fantastic and fun. Um, it's called Women of the Water. And um, yeah, really being able to identify, identify needs of the aquaculture community has been you know, something that I've focused on um, in my fellowship. But backing up a little bit, I am not originally from any of the coastal states. I am from Kentucky. Um, so, Growing up, sit, telling people that I wanted to be a marine scientist was kind of weird. They were like, where'd you get that from? Um, <laughs> so I have kind of taken that perspective into the world of science policy of trying to make sure in whatever I'm doing, I can relate these ocean science concepts and these coastal, coastal issues back to people who may not even realize that those things are impacting them even hundreds of miles away from the coast. Um, but that's kind of a long, a long winded, you know, introduction. So I'll, I'll pause it for there. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks to all three of you for giving us that background and, and information. And I think as others are thinking about some questions that they might have for you. Um, I, I wanted to sort of dive a little bit more deeply into um, this idea of advocacy, um, because our attendees this uh, weekend have now had the chance to go through three distinct workshops on some advocacy pathways, um, partnerships and uh, outreach, um, coalition building and op-ed writing. So each of those sort of focusing on a different effort when it comes to a policy idea and getting actual movement, getting people on board with it, um, looking at who you can partner with at an organizational level who might already be engaged in the work, looking at building up your actual team of individuals who are gonna help you get something done, and then looking at how do you actually persuade the public? How do you, you know, use writing and use the media as a tool to be able to get your ideas out there? And so um, that's what we've sort of primed them for. And then tomorrow they'll have a chance to really start to get to work on whatever their policy idea is and what action they wanna take with it. So sort of choosing what pathway they wanna spend some time developing and working on. Um, so with you all as folks that have been engaged, um, you know, through your fellowships, through your careers, um, in science policy work and in advocacy work, I'm curious to know a little bit about your first experiences in advocacy work. Um, what, what experience do you have on those pathways or on other pathways? And what were some of the things that you, um, you know, encountered along the way, some of the things that maybe were surprising or things that you had to like overcome or embrace uh, when you realized that, no, I'm, I'm gonna be involved in science policy, I'm gonna be involved in advocacy. Um, 
and here's, you know, here's just the reality of it. But I'd love to sort of hear what was it like the first time that you were engaged uh, doing this work? And, and what did you sort of discover um, that might be helpful for those that are just dipping their feet into uh, this world of science policy advocacy? And I'll open it up for anybody that wants to jump in there first. I'm still unmuted, so I, I guess I can jump in. Um, I would say the first kind of instance that I can think of, like a formal kind of foray into the world of advocacy was when I was in undergrad uh, at the University of Alabama. And um, I was at the Tuscaloosa campus. So again, not close to the ocean for marine scientists. It's like, okay, you know, what are you doing here? Um, and one of the big projects that I accomplished along with the Marine Science Club and several other student organizations was we ended up hosting what we called the Blue and Green Sustainability Gala. And we featured these murals that we had constructed out of bottle caps that students had donated or discarded. And they're like, all right, we can't recycle these at the time, like they couldn't recycle bottle caps in the area. So they would bring them in to the biology building um, for extra credit. And we took a lot of those bottle caps and we ended up making these pretty big murals of ocean life and sea creatures and ended up highlighting underneath the murals, basically the all of the subjects of those art pieces were animals or environments that were disproportionately affected by climate change and plastic pollution. So again, trying to connect people who aren't close to the ocean with these coastal issues and marine issues that they may not have in their backyard, um, but relating it to daily actions, like did you have, you know, did you use a plastic bottle today? how much plastic are you actually throwing out just in the period of a week or a month? Um, so yeah, with, with that, like it was a long-term project because we were just undergrad students working on nights and weekends, like constructing these art pieces. None of us were artists. We we're just like, all right, let's, let's make something that we're proud of that we think that the campus can relate to. Um, and yeah, when, when we were kind of organizing the event, of course, like resources can be limited um, in terms of like money to, to construct things or to get people in the door. But also, I mean, as somebody who is, you know, studying to become a scientist, there was some level of pushback just in talking with people like, oh, well, science is supposed to be objective. Like you're not supposed to have these like strong opinions about things. You're not, you know, how does that color your work? And I'm like, well, okay. I mean, yes and no, like there, we still need science driven policy. Um, and I wanna help that, you know, become more, come more to the forefront of people's discussions on campus. Um, rather than just having it fade into the background. So yeah, that's great. I, so that actually sparked something that Olivia had mentioned earlier too, Blair, because you said, you know, you didn't have necessarily like an artistic background and yet this project that, that, that you were doing required you to sort of think outside the box and do something a little bit different to try and create that connection with people. And so Olivia, I'm curious, as somebody that did sort of approach it from, you know, you had a scientific background, but you also had an English background, a writing background, what, what other skills were you like surprised that you didn't realize that you were suddenly going to be utilizing when you started to move into science policy and advocacy, um, or things that you just were not expecting at all that suddenly you're like, oh, I'm going to need to learn how to do that. And that's going to be really helpful now as I'm establishing my career. And Kristen, I mean, same for you, because you also mentioned sort of having a certain you know, sort of this this meandering journey a little bit and going back and forth from some different fields. So I, yeah, I'd be curious if either of you have so, some other insights on things that you didn't expect that you would need that turned out to be really helpful skills that you had to build in the long run. I mean, I think, yes, definitely. Um, 
I'd say a combination, and I guess they weren't entirely surprising, but um, being able to analyze in a lot of different ways um, has come in handy. The uh, a position that I had earlier um, was a temporary position at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I was helping them with this uh, climate change related um, project that they were doing. And part of it was helping scientists who uh, are witnesses who have to give testimony before Congress around climate change topics. So one of the things that I didn't think I would be spending a lot of my time doing and did was watching recordings of this testimony for a very long time. And then I would create my own categories of the kinds of comments and questions, often hostile ones, that scientists would encounter in order to kind of uh, create a taxonomy, let's say. So using the English skills around the analysis and the biology skills around the taxonomy to create these sort of question clades, let's say, to say here are you know where these kind fall and how can you respond to them? So I'd say that was one of the ways early on that I had not anticipated these, these skill sets coming together. Kristen, what about you? What, what were some of the things that you either didn't realize that you would utilize so much in science policy or things that you're still like, oh, I, I now have to learn this other skill set on top. Yeah, I would say that um, maybe also like a skill that academia didn't quite prepare me for or um, teach me necessarily or emphasize enough um, was probably the skill of like collaboration. Um, so with the Rest Restore Council, you know, we have um, a board of members that's made up of representatives from each state along the Gulf of Mexico, um, in addition to each of the federal agencies that operate within the Gulf, um, so like Department of the, the Interior, USDA, EPA, um, and you have all of these members coming together and kind of forming an opinion or a decision about what will happen in terms of restoration along the Gulf of Mexico with the help of the science that the um, both they're bringing to the table and we from the Restore Council are bringing to the table as well. Um, so that process, of course, requires such an extensive amount of collaboration and effort finding common ground. And I feel within academia, of course, you're kind of nestled safely within the niche of the topic that you're studying. So I collaborated, of course, with lots of other people who are studying things similar to my area of interest in grad school. So I'm primarily focused on pollinator health and conservation and worked with people working with different species of pollinators or studying things in a slightly different way, but it's not quite the same as reaching across disciplines and trying to pull someone from a completely different field um, onto a topic that maybe they're not familiar with or you're not familiar with either and trying to find some common ground there. Um, so I feel that looking back on graduate school and just my experience in general that um, you know, efforts and opportunities to collaborate um, are really places where I wish I would have grabbed on a little bit harder and um, just embraced those opportunities even more. Um, but yeah, so, but needless to say, I'm having that opportunity to build those skills now um, with the Restore Council, which is really great. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I, I, and panelists, please feel free to jump in at any point if you want to add on to each other's stuff. Otherwise, I'm, I'll keep sort of interjecting questions and same for, for everybody uh, on the call. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, and, and I want to make sure that you all have time to do that as well. But so on that sort of topic of collaboration, right? So we, we went through uh, a workshop about coalition building and we talked about finding the right team members um, to help you get movement around an idea and, and to do that. I guess my question is, what, what um, advice do you maybe have for a group that might be spending their time tomorrow a few hours researching potential collaborators, um, thinking through who might be a good fit for their policy ideas that they want to work on? which might rent, run the gamut of, you know, something really small and local in their community to like just trying to build a coalition around a much larger, you know, national or global problem um, that they want to be involved with. Um, what advice do you have about finding who to even begin to have those conversations with, especially when you're thinking of, I need to involve people who are not necessarily scientists, 
um, you know, that come from different backgrounds because they're going to have different skill sets or they're going to have knowledge or connections that are going to help. Um, what experiences or advice do you have for folks that are starting to think about those collaborators in particular? Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, you know, one thing I would say is I think it's really valuable to think of those non-scientist communities, um, especially in, in local areas and so on because you're gonna find a lot more of those for one. Um, and if you're talking about issues that are relevant to the region, those are the people who are going to be really committed to it, even if they don't yet know that they are committed to it because they don't yet know how the science connects, which is of course part of your job is to show them how that is. Um, but you know, thinking about groups like, for example, um, retirement centers or other communities with seniors, are, for example, is a really good group because these are people who have a lot of time to spend on lobbying uh, their policymakers and often will. So if you are able to uh, connect with them over an issue, you have a block of people who can potentially be very determined and may have a lot of additional connections in the community. You know, similarly, if you're thinking in local, more local levels, and it is your local level, sometimes it's good to think about the actual scientific or science policy issue that you're working on. Sometimes it's good to think about what kinds of affiliations and associations you yourself have. If you're associated with various volunteer organizations or religious institution or similar, where you think if you were to talk with a group, they might become interested in the same issue and you are already perceived as being part of that community. That's always a great way to start too, because I think we sometimes forget when we are scientists that we are also other people. We have all of these other facets and connections and that can be another way in. I'd also say that sometimes it's worth remembering that there are going to be uh, groups or parts of the community who are going to be really wary of scientists, whether that's because science itself has become a politicized issue, the particular topic that you might be talking about, or because for a lot of historically marginalized communities, science has actually been a force of disenfranchisement. So being kind of aware of that, and if there are groups where you think you really do want to try to work with those communities, thinking about how you can find someone who is already either a member of that group or a trusted liaison whom you can work with is a really great place to start rather than sort of trying to cold call in areas where this may be a more sensitive issue and you are not yourself part of the group. I would absolutely agree with what Olivia is saying. I think um, one of the biggest things that um, that I think is important is like, you know, we, we can only do so much as individuals. And so identifying people who are already established, like doing the work, we, you know, we can only accomplish so much by ourselves. Like we have to have people who have expertises in other areas that we ourselves may not have. Um, so I think, kind of having a broad picture of like all of the puzzle pieces that you need to accomplish your goal is a good place to start. Um, you know, identifying your like internal team's strengths and weaknesses is um, kind of a crucial first step. And then that way, you know who to seek out or you can narrow down who you need to seek out um, from there. And I think also having, um, when you're looking for potential partners, approaching it as tiers of support, um, having local, regional, and then if this is a large scale project, having state or national partners coming in. Um, it's always easiest to start small, make sure that you have a good core community of people who are dedicated and invested in making the project a reality. And then once you have that trust, that belief, that core team, it's a lot easier to start pulling in bigger partners and roping them, you know, roping them into 
what you're trying to accomplish. Um, yeah, and I think all of that is accomplished best through having a really clear core narrative and you know really good communication with all of your partners. And it's a lot of work to keep that up for sure. Um, but as long as everyone's still like on the same page, then it's, you know, it makes things go a lot smoother when you're like building your, your coalition. Yeah, and I think I just wanna echo what both Blair and Olivia just said. Those were excellent answers. Um, from my own personal experience, similar to what Olivia first mentioned, working with retirees has been um, an incredibly valuable experience for me in terms of the pollinator outreach and um, education that I've done throughout New Orleans primarily. And um, the retirees that I met throughout New Orleans were already very well connected within the community. I mean, they had been living in the area for decades at that point. They were part of multiple organizations, um, environmental organizations, Sierra Club, Master Naturalist. Um, things like that. They knew tons of people. Um, and so they were really, and they had the enthusiasm too um, for um, moving forward with advocating for the things that we were interested in. Um, so yeah, I think that that can be a, sometimes a surprising but um, untapped source of um, collaboration. That's wonderful. That's that's such a great suggestion and definitely a great group to motivate. Um, having worked in, you know, education policy and needing to get like, you know, local ballot initiatives passed for school districts and knowing how much the folks that are 65 and over make or break um, something that is going to be locally relevant. Um, it, you, you cannot ignore some of those groups that, you know, sometimes you might think might be you know, hostile or might not be interested, um, you, you have to engage them. So it's great to hear um, you, you all share those experiences and, and perspectives. And it's great to see also, you know, in talking about some of your experiences with coalition building and how to think about your teams and how well it aligns with what we heard in our workshop earlier. I mean, it's just always wonderful when you get reinforced ideas from speakers and it just sort of helps reaffirm that, that you know, these are things to consider and things to really think about. Um, I guess I, I, one of the things that I, I think Blair, you had mentioned, you know, that you can start small and have a good core community of people there, you know, sort of locally that might give you the energy momentum to build up from there. Um, you know, I'm curious more about that. I think it's really easy to look at a lot of these problems that feel so global and monumental and think, how can I actually start to make a difference or, or, or do anything there? And I think, you know, that point is you can start locally. I'm curious if anybody else has other experiences or advice that they would share um, on, on translating maybe these really big ideas to something that is relevant to a smaller local group of people where you can actually like see movement uh, and see things happen that sometimes you can get really sort of disillusioned when, you know, uh, a federal government or a state government isn't moving as quickly as you want them to. I mean, just quick, I, I definitely defer to Kristen and Blair who are do, on the ground doing a lot of this right now, but um, just a couple of things that occur to me, you know, I think something that is really significant and that is is too often overlooked is the value of local school boards um, and the kind of influence that we can have on what how the next generation is being informed basically about science in general and then how that science can can be applied to all kinds of relevant societal issues so i think that that's one area of working small that can really have a huge impact um you know if you can help to guide and vet valuable sources of educational information on science uh so that's one major one in and of itself and then yeah i think often Often because it is so overwhelming, there's there's not just can you get momentum on, on local issues, but you can, you know, garner those moments of hope that sustain you for the larger fight, right? If you can get people in a community to agree that there should be, 
you know, a charge for garbage pickup, but not for recycling or, you know, lower charge or something, you know, or include composting or whatever small thing it might be that will actually have an impact locally. Not only are you doing something, but you, you, it can also, again, just help sustain you and that community to feel as if they then have agency to do more. Definitely. Um, I would say like just pulling from a couple of examples that, that I've come across during my fellowship term. Um, one of the big ones that is definitely more on like, you know, the, the docket for the division of aquaculture um, is this idea of restoration aquaculture. A lot of the farmers, uh, especially shellfish farmers in the state of Florida have known for a long time that they're their farms, their operations, their lease sites were performing these really valuable ecosystem services. Um, they were, you know, providing as surrogate oyster reef habitat for a lot of animals. They were providing enhanced water quality um, along with a host of other habitat, you know, functions. And so there's been a lot of investment put in by the aquaculture community in Florida to getting this idea of using aquaculture as a restoration tool um, and potentially in the future having the ability for farmers to get paid for the ecosystem services that their products are providing. Um, this is still kind of in the infancy of, of the actual policy work, but um, a couple of weeks ago, I actually attended a workshop where we had farmers, extension agents, policymakers, um, and general stakeholders in restoration who are all very invested in this idea of how do we help mitigate, you know, worsening water quality in our coastal areas and can aquaculture be one of the tools in the tool belt um, to help that, you know, to help ameliorate this issue that we're seeing. Um, so in that case, it's, you know, it's on a state level, but there are pockets of, you know, small communities that are all banding together around this idea that, hey, what we've been doing for a long time, we should do more of that <laughs> to really help our situation. Um, and then with the Women of the Water Conference that I helped pioneer during my fellowship, really we had a lot of attendees who had never been in a space that was focused on the advancement of women and gender minorities in aquaculture that had never been you know, a space that they had experienced. And there is a lot, there's a dearth of data um, on how women and gender minorities are contributing to the industry. And so being able to provide that space and provide that forum for a lot of the discussions um, that we had on challenges that people are facing in the industry, that was a really big deal for, you know, we had attendees from undergraduates all the way to retirees. Um, so it was, we had people from five states, but most people were from Florida. And again, having that small community who can start making changes or promoting ideas to better the industry. Um, it's a good place to start, starting small. <laughs> yeah, and I would agree with, um all of that as well. And that um, starting small is a really good place to start in terms of a lot of the work that I was doing for my PhD with pollinators and um, monitoring pollinator disease, creating urban habitat for pollinators. Um, the group that I worked with, we were mostly going out into the field and to front yards in New Orleans doing this work. We are capturing butterflies. We were counting things. We were um, collecting all kinds of environmental data. Um, and in the process of doing that, inevitably, we would encounter so many people from the community. We used to joke that um, we would have at least one screamer every day. <laughs> so someone who would come running out of their house, see us in the front yard in their neighborhood screaming at us, and we would explain to them what it was we were doing, that it was we were focused on pollinator conservation, and we were doing X, Y, Z in this front yard, and this was why, this is the data we were getting. And that over time, I mean, we did this in the front yard thing every week, multiple times a week for almost three years. 
Um, and over that time, we really developed a network of people who we were reaching um, very close, very locally, who um, maybe didn't really think much about pollinator conservation before or conservation in general. And then we're having one-on-one -on -one interactions with scientists who are actively collecting data. And it was kind of reshaping their whole opinion about, um, you know, the bugs in their yard, what have you, or um, maybe giving them a little more information about how their front yard ecosystem is working. And um, so that was a really rewarding experience, actually feeling like we were actively reaching people on the ground. And I feel like when you're just getting started, it's really encouraging to have those kinds of experiences where you can feel like you're really connecting with someone who maybe doesn't know much about the topic that you're focused on at that time. And they're, you know, hearing what you say and you're having good back and forth and you can see their opinion changing as you're talking to them or, um, you know, their understanding happening as you're talking to them. Um, that can be super encouraging and also incredibly important um, for that community itself to be involved in that work that you're doing in that capacity. So, yeah. That's great. I love all of these, of these you know, examples and, and showing how this work can be put into practice. And, and I hope that that's helpful to those that are thinking about how they can start developing some plans for tomorrow. I wanna to touch on sort of the, the opposite of what we were just talking about, Kristen, because you were bringing up like how impactful it is when you're working with people and they're seeing a difference and you're doing that. And Olivia, you know, you mentioned that that sort of is that it, it feeds your soul a little bit and it gives you the motivation to keep going when that happens. But all three of you have also mentioned at different times in this talk so far about misconceptions of scientists, of science ideas, of people that maybe have different opinions. You know, I think, um, you know, Blair, you said something about isn't science supposed to be objective? So why are you coming in with opinions or how are things being politicized or, you know, how are there, you know, uh, are there historical, you know, issues and, and you know, traditionally, you know, groups that have been underrepresented or marginalized um, by science in different ways that are coming at it from a place of distrust. Um, I guess I would be curious, um, especially with this group that is maybe getting into this the first time, right, and hasn't necessarily had a chance to develop thick skin, um, or is also dealing with what a lot of grad students deal with, and it's imposter syndrome, and they think, am I even, you know, qualified to be the one to talk on this issue? You know, why should people listen to me? Um, what, you know, what, how would you respond to that? Or how would you maybe motivate, um, especially those that are maybe still in the early stages of figuring some of this out, on how to deal with the negatives uh, or the people that are going to say no or that are going to question why they're, you know, in this space doing this work um, and, and maybe some, you know, tips or ways that you've overcome those difficult conversations uh, or have moved past it when that's happened through your experiences as you're working around a specific policy idea. Yeah, so I think that, um, so I haven't been with the Restore Council for too long, um, but watching some of the work that has been done there with collaborating on issues like, um, you know, water quality issues, for example, across the Gulf, where you have multiple states involved and some may want to be um, more involved in um, water quality conservation in their state, but there's limited funding, so you have to kind of tug and pull where it goes and who gets it and what have, what have you. Um, so during kind of arguments like that, I think um, one of the things my boss mentioned was always keeping in mind kind of this overall common goal and objective that everyone has who's part of this team who's working together. So even if you're working with someone who maybe doesn't necessarily um, agree with the science that you're presenting or with the um, objective that you feel you have, there is something common there between you and trying to find that piece of common ground and hold on to it and use that as um, kind of the way to bridge a connection between the people you're collaborating with, I think is really helpful. But then also at the same time, recognizing that um, there will never be a 100% um, of the people who you, your audience, who you're able to fully appeal to. So for every 10, one of the people we had screaming at us while collecting pollinator data, 
um, nine of them would come around and be like, okay, I see what you're doing. This is great. It's really exciting. I love what you're doing for these reasons. We would have one who would tell us they were, you know, outraged and wanted to call the police on us. So, and you just had to kind of, you know, let it go kind of a thing and recognize that there were, there were no words that could really bridge that gap there. Um, but for the most part, I, I think that overall, there is always some kind of common ground there that can be used to kind of drive the conversation forward, even when things feel really incompatible. I definitely agree with what Kristen's saying. Um, yeah, I've, I've found that um, a lot of times people have the, the same goals. Like there's the same, people usually want the same things, but the way that the goal is achieved is what people quibble over a lot of times. Um, and so as long as you can find a common ground and you can meet people where they're at, um, a lot of those conversations go a bit smoother <laughs> than they would have otherwise. Um, you know, for questions about aquaculture and water quality, it's like, you know, everyone wants access to clean water. Nobody likes having harmful algal blooms in their area. Nobody likes dealing with fish kills. Um, and we all want reliable access to clean water and seafood and like, you know, good quality protein. So it's like once you've identified the core kind of kernel of your project, then it's a lot easier to communicate with others. Um, as far as imposter syndrome, in my opinion, it doesn't really ever go away. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've I've been in my science policy fellow fellowship with the National Academies for like a year and a couple of months now. And I mean, I feel like I've, I've kind of come into my own, but also there's still days where I'm like, I don't know if I'm like qualified to be talking about this. I don't know if I'm like the right person to address these questions to, but at the end of the day, I think realizing that like you wouldn't be in the room or like you wouldn't be part of the conversation if, you weren't supposed to be there if you weren't qualified to be there. Um, and I think having a good team of support around you, um, people who trust you to, you know, know your job, know your facts, and um, people who are comfortable delegating responsibility to you is a good way to kind of build, you know, build your confidence and help to slowly work against the imposter syndrome. Those are both, yeah, um, great responses. And I'll, I'll just add a, a little bit. Um, one thing I would say is depending on the topic, obviously there are some where this is always gonna be a thing, but I would also say, I think often the fear of sort of a violent reaction is much bigger than the actual amount of violent reaction that you're gonna get from people. So people, scientists who are starting out are often you know, anticipating that they're gonna get all of this hostility and you, you don't get it nearly as much as you're afraid to by and large. Um, but you know, that said, as, as Kristen and Laura were both saying, connecting with people and being able to connect on those shared values is so critical when there are areas where you think someone is at least going to be resistant, even if they're not actually hostile, to start with that idea of what you share in common, to start to with asking questions of the people you're talking to about what they've noticed or what they want, so that they know, first of all, that you actually care about their opinion, and you can get a better sense again of what their concerns are, and then how you can tie them back into what you want to talk about. And knowing too that you know, to affect any kind of change is not going to happen during a single meeting, that this is all going to be through a long-term relationship that you're going to achieve the kind of goals that you have. So not being as discouraged if one doesn't go as well or as quickly as you'd hoped, knowing that this is going to build, everything is going to build upon itself. Um, and yeah, I think also bearing in mind that on the occasions if you're in a group and there is someone who's hostile, 
to respond remembering that really your audience is everybody else there, you know, who's not saying anything. Um, both because I think that helps you stay more optimistic to remember most of these people are not against me, but also to kind of remember to, you know, not get snappy or snarky in return. Uh, not only because even though it might feel good in the moment, it never really helps, but because you're really working to help connect with everybody else who's listening. So you don't want to sort of take on the same negative tone that someone might take towards you. And then, yeah, I, I this confidence thing. I So I think this is the downside, right, of specialization in science. As we specialize so much that we get to a point where we're like, Oh, yes, you know, I can talk about chemoreception and butterflies, but if you want to hear about chemoreception and moths, then I'm going to have to delegate that to the expert in the area. Like, this, is, this is not what's going on, you know? Like, I think it is very hard for scientists to feel like they are experts in sort of science writ large, right, outside of a very tiny field. But I think it's really worth remembering that when you're talking with journalists, when you're talking with people in a community, or when you're talking with other decision makers, these people are not secretly members of your dissertation committee. You know, they're not going to ask you things like why you chose this statistical method versus that one, or try to trip you up about specific, really abstruse areas of science that you still feel less confident about. They're going to ask you things like, how does this matter to me? What is this going to cost? How is this affecting my area? What can I do about it? So those are the kinds of questions you're going to want to be prepared to answer and, and practice for. But you're not going to need to answer really detailed questions that you yourself are feeling a little worried about, you know, from terror from your PhD. On the other hand, it's also really important, and we encounter this sometimes too, to respect other people's expertise, right? So occasionally we have to remind this, um, folks of this, if they're coming in to talk about science with say staffers or something like that, that the people you're talking to aren't gonna know the science for sure, almost universally, not universally, but by and large, but they are going to know a lot about how policy happens, a lot more than you. And they are also, so you are also going to have to be aware that policy is not just about science. It's about how that intersects with all kinds of other societal issues and decisions and effects. So you can't sort of become too impatient or like bull your way in because these other aspects also have to be considered. So sort of balancing that sense of confidence with that sense of respect, I think is really important too. This is great. This is wonderful advice. And, and I, I hope uh, everyone is um, getting lots of ideas and thinking through um, not only their particular project that they might want to work on tomorrow a little bit, but also just sort of broad strokes, ways to stay engaged. And, and I think a lot of this advice is transferable, not just the advocacy work, but but a lot of the different areas that that you're you're all going to touch in your careers. Um, so I appreciate all those insights. And I know that we're coming up about 10 minutes left in the panel and, and our time today. So I want to make sure that folks um, that are in watching have a chance to ask any questions. So please raise your hands, tap, type in the chat if there's anything that you want to ask. Um, if not, I'll, I have a few kind of final follow-up questions uh, to round out the panel, and then we'll go over a couple of quick housekeeping things for tomorrow uh, and, and be set with our day. Um, I think one thing um, that I sort of want to ask this group while, while folks are thinking of any last minute questions, I mentioned that that they're going to have basically a two hour block of time tomorrow um, to work with other people that want to think about coalition building or want to think about partnerships or want to think about op-ed writing and to be able to collaborate, share ideas, brainstorm, and also just sit down and do some work. Um, maybe that's planning out their goals, maybe that's writing some drafts of emails, maybe it's just doing research on what organizations could I even start doing this work for. 
Um, so I guess, you know, sort of a, a, a sort of esoteric question for you all, but if, if you were thinking about a project or a pet project, either that you're involved with or one that you've always wanted to sort of get off the ground, uh, you know, if you had that magical extra day in the week that you could dedicate to that, um, and you had this block of time to sit down and start thinking about how do I follow one of these pathways? What would I do with that time? What would you do if you if you had a block of time um, tomorrow to sit down and think about, here's my idea, here's what I want to see happen. How do I start? How do I, you know, based on your experiences, how would you start actually putting a plan together, putting some ideas, putting something down so that you have a tangible artifact that you can then take with you and hopefully come back to and make time for and be intentional about it moving forward. This is a hard question. <laughs> um, oh, I would say, well, so most kind of pressing on my mind currently is the fact, so we had our 2022 Women of the Water Conference uh, in July or June of this year. So a lot of my spare time is being used to plan 2023. Um, and we are um, hoping to expand programming to having some kind of offsite field trips, having more exposure to career diversity, bringing in more diverse communities into our conference community. So really working on the logistics of that and who to who to bring to the table um, and how to actually make that a reality is very much on the forefront of things I'm working on. Um, but kind of like fun pet projects, I would really love to put together a like a marine science boot camp for landlocked kids because like that was something I always wished that I had um you know going to public school in Kentucky like I was the weird kid who wanted to study marine science and I mean the ocean is nowhere near <laughs> nowhere near us so having more marine science kind of outreach education materials for people who are not near the coast would be really fun So I was thinking of a different idea initially, and then you said marine science outreach, and I was like, ooh. <laughs> um, because um, when I was in graduate school, one of the things that I was part of was a K-12 outreach program that took us into New Orleans public schools that were underperforming in science and math, and we taught um, kind of lessons that we created ourselves as graduate students to them about ecology and different other topics. Um, and um, that was a really rewarding experience, but I would love to see something like that replicated in rural areas. I feel like generally rural school districts kind of get the short end of the stick in terms of um, resources um, from university systems, especially because we do so much with the children in New Orleans, uh, Tulane does at least. Um, and I know that's true for a lot of other places where there's large universities in place and there are a lot of other resources that those rural communities aren't able to access where they are. So I think that um, if I had an opportunity to do a pet project, it would be something to do with um, increasing science um, outreach and education in rural areas in particular. Um, and then kind of along the same, not same vein, similar vein, I guess, um, would be a pet project working on um, kind of bringing together all of the data on conservation and restoration that's been done along the Gulf Coast. So there have been so many projects done in large part due to the money that came from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, a lot of that money has gone into these projects and kind of bringing all of the data together from those projects to then guide future policies and recommendations for continued restoration and recovery along the Gulf of Mexico, I think is really important. It's almost like we've gotten to a point where we've done so much restoration and conservation along the Gulf in so many different places with so many different small organizations taking the lead on those projects that it's hard to kind of determine where we need to go next um, and what hasn't been done and what has been done. 
Um, so I think doing something like that would be really incredible. And I would start with trying to determine, because I know it's a topic that's on a lot of people's minds on the Gulf Coast, trying to connect um, with people who might be interested in or working on that same issue. And there are some groups formed already that do some like data exercises along the Gulf Coast. So I would try to plug into those groups um, and connect with people who are um, similarly interested in this topic and then kind of spread out and expand from there on that topic. Those are great. And I do not have other ideas as you have, which are Awesome. I love those that you suggested. Um, I would just say from a starting point perspective that, yeah, I I learn really well from example. So I think spending some of the time is like a big dump of we're going to search a whole bunch of stuff and see what's out there already and what people are already doing in this general area or something, you know, in a different topic area, but along the same lines as the sort of thing I'm envisioning, whether it's what kind of op-eds have people written in this realm what, or, you know, what kind of projects are going on similar to this. And then from that, trying to derive some inspiration and seeing which parts are good and which are bad and what you can take and what you can throw out. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for indulging in that uh, little thought experiment and, and sharing that. But I think especially as folks are, you know, coming into tomorrow and thinking about their ideas, hearing some examples of some other things, it doesn't, you know, these these all connect to different areas. And sometimes you you just like in your research, you have to pick a small piece of it and think, what movement can I make here that is going to make a shift in this overall area of climate or energy, agriculture, you know, whatever, uh, you know, is, is your passion uh, there as well. So thank you for that. Um, we, we have just a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to give our panelists a chance to uh, plug anything, um, you know, is, uh, is there anything that is coming up that this group may be interested in? Um, where can they find you uh, if they have other questions or just want to connect? Um, uh, feel free to sort of let us know. I mean, I think, Blair, you've talked about, uh, you know, your, your uh, upcoming plans, and, and I think there's a lot of folks that would be interested in that. But if there's anything else that you'd want to share with this group, uh, I'd love to give you the chance to do so. Uh, I'm putting a couple of links in the chat just for uh, resources that we have through sharing science. We have a lot of uh, toolkits that have to do with all kinds of different areas of science communication and science policy, um, as well as this virtual learning hub where we have sort of summations of a lot of past webinars that we've done on a lot of different things from storytelling and science, online work, et cetera, that also has brief animated summaries so you don't have to watch a whole archive webinar and infographics and so forth. So I hope that some of those could be useful. Yeah, I will just plug again, the Women of the Water Conference 2023 is coming up. Uh, this coming year. We don't have a date set yet, but usually it's held in the early summer. Um, I think we're shooting for June. Um, if I can find my website link, I will drop it in the chat. <laughs> um, and I can also drop a link in the chat to the nutrient credit uh, framework that I've helped put together with the Department of Agriculture. If anyone's interested in reading some of the, the science policy work that goes into that. Yeah, and I'm happy to share a link just for the fellowship that um, Blair and I are part of. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity so far and I'm just getting started. Um, but yes, and also really grateful that um, I was able to be here today and be part of this and an excellent experience. Great. So thank you. We, we are so grateful to you for your time, uh, all three of you for participating and sharing your thoughts and insights. I think it'll really help this group um, be motivated moving forward and give them some ideas. And feel free if there are other links, I'm gonna send a whole list of resources and things. So if there's anything that you think of later, let me know and I'll make sure that this group has access to it as well. Uh, otherwise, uh, whatever's in the chat, I'll also pull over into that list. But um, uh, let's hear it for our panel. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thanks for taking your time to, to share your, your insights with us. Um, I just want to plug again uh, really quick um, that I have this very uh, brief uh, kind of broad uh, uh, check.
second exit ticket um, for you all uh, at that link, uh, and it's in the chat as well. Um, but feel free to uh, take a few minutes, let us know your thoughts going into tomorrow and uh, some thinking that we can use for this event in the future. And then uh, before you all go, just as a preview, for uh, tomorrow, we'll begin at 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a quick check-in. We'll sort of debrief some of the things today, get you started on the right foot for uh, your advocacy breakout groups, give you the chance to join which one of those groups um, you want to participate in and spend a couple of hours working with others around. Then we'll all come back for kind of a final debrief, uh, thinking about goals and, and, and setting, those, setting the stage basically for the next uh, then what comes next uh, for you all as individuals and how we at NSPN could support you through programming, uh, through different opportunities, things like that. So that's what to expect for tomorrow. Um, but again, if you all uh, don't mind uh, when you get that link for the exit ticket, if you haven't already, to fill that out. Otherwise, panelists, thank you again so much. Thanks for rounding out our first day. I think it was really, really enlightening. Uh, I certainly learned a lot, and I so appreciate your time. Uh, and so hopefully we'll have a chance to do uh, more events like this with you all in the future. But um, that is it for today. If anybody has any last-minute questions, anything like that, wants to stick around, I'm happy to do so. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow uh, at 1 Eastern for our second day and, and uh, actual uh, practice uh, of uh, some advocacy work together um, as part of the event. Thanks so much, y'all. Yeah, thanks so much. And best of luck to all of you tomorrow as you develop your project. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Bye.